morning. Um, thank you, choir, and uh, I'll ask the question, do you believe? Amen. Amen. I have a couple of things I wanted to share with you. I, have, I had a note in my Bible that I had, had stuck away and didn't know it was there. Um, so I wanted to read this note um, from the Turner family. It says, words cannot express how we feel about the hospitality you have shown to our family. The soups and the sandwiches were delicious, and the flowers arrangement was beautiful. We ask that you continue praying for our family. May God bless you all. And that was from the Turner family. And I do apologize for not reading that sooner. I, had, uh, I, I didn't see it in my Bible in time to remember. Uh, I, I do want to just share a couple things with you. Uh, we've been in the past, Easter is coming upon us, and in the past we normally have a service on um, on um, Friday night which commemorates the crucifixion of Christ, and we're going to have a Monday service this time on Thursday evening, and we'll celebrate that last supper with the disciples. Uh, it'll be a little bit uh, dramatized, and we encourage you to come. It'll be at 7 o'clock on Thursday the 24th, and so and, and tell your friends about that. It's, it's going to be um, a wonderful experience as we come into this season. Uh, that should always be on our hearts, you know, the, uh, the time that um, should mean the most to every Christian, what took place upon the cross and the resurrection that gives us hope in this life and the life to come. And I know you've heard me talking about uh, for quite some time now about the Truth Project, and we'll be doing that. Um, coming up uh, later in this month, uh, but actually the Sunday before we start that, we're going to invite everyone to come out because we want to be prayerful for a number of things, but as we begin, begin to study the Truth Project, uh, we're going to have everyone come out on a Sunday evening, and we'll announce the time and everything for it to, to watch the movie The War Room together, and so we'll all come together and, and watch that and talk about it afterwards, and so we can have our hearts ready for... Um, for the studies that we'll be heading into. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to James chapter 1, beginning verse 9. As I was studying this, I was going to teach on the rest of the chapter in James, and I, as I was into the midst of it, I saw that that was impossible. And uh, uh, it's just like on Bible study on Wednesday nights, you know, it's, it's usually rather hard for me to get completed what it is that I have set out to do. Uh, but God's Word is so good, and sometimes you just got to spend some time and not rush through some things. And I encourage you to come on Wednesday nights. We're in the midst right now of studying how to study your Bible. Uh, so if you've been wondering how it is that you're supposed to sit down and, and begin a study of God's Word, you come, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm certain this will be helpful to you. I'm going to ask you if you'll stand as we read these verses, um, James 9 through 18. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position, because he will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, it blossoms, falls, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Let us pray. Father, I pray that your word be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Let it teach us, let it guide us, and let us respond. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated, if you will. Some time ago, uh, Kim and I watched a movie. It was called Sarah's Key. I don't know if you've ever seen it. I recommend it. It's a good movie. It's about 
uh, Jews that were living in France during World War II. And, and it shows how they were, they were taken from their homes and, and placed in the concentration camps that were in those places in Europe and the different areas. And, and the story was about a little girl who, was, who, who had a brother and she was looking out for him. And, and as the Nazis came in to take the Jews out, she hid her little brother in, a, in a, a secret closet in the house. And she told him not to speak, not to say anything, to be very, very quiet. She locked him inside. And she said, I'll come back to let you out. Well, the circumstances happened. She was captured herself, and she wasn't able to come back to let her brother out. And he died in there. And, you know, it, it, it was a story of how it affected her life from then on, how it, how it almost destroyed it. Every decision that she made was... Was, 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 was based upon the, the, the act that she took in trying to help her brother, but such great tragedy happened because of it. Um, these Jews were being persecuted during this terrible war um, by evil, evil people. And, and, and James, is, is he's talking to these, these Jews at this particular time that we talked about last week somewhat, he, he, he says, you know, because they were being persecuted, they were going through some of the same things. They were being, they were being arrested, they were being executed, they were, their belongings were being confiscated and taken from them. And James is saying, you know, if, if you've had any of your position, possessions taken away, if you've been humiliated, if you've been persecuted, rejoice. Rejoice in this. These people are like a lot of us today. You know, they were sold on the philosophy that happiness comes from having stuff. The more stuff you got, the happier you're going to be. You know, the bigger the stuff, the faster the stuff, the nicer, whatever it is, it's going to make me happy if I've got the newest stuff that's out. I know uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm one of those cell phone people. I, I like to get the new ones when they come out. I, I just like it. And it does so much stuff, I don't even know what to do with it. I mean, you can get the cell phones that will change the channels on your TV. I don't know how to do that, but mine does it. I'm glad to know it does. Bigger and fancier stuff. Um, I, and, and I ask you this, how many of you ever have, have I, and there may be some of you here, I don't know, but have everything that you've worked for all your life, every, everything that you've put into what in, in this life, it was all taken away from you. I mean, you, you lost everything. Homes, cars, jobs, money, whatever it was, family. Lost it all. I mean, I, I, it's hard to imagine that. And some of you may have gone through that. I don't know. But this is what these people were going through. They lost everything, everything that they had held precious to them. Verse 9 and 11 says, The brother of humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position. But the one who is rich should take pride in his low position because we will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. It, it blossoms, it fails, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. When Kim and I were younger. Um, we lived in Wilmington. Our children were very little. It was always funny. It was about the time that the ATM machines came out and you know, there would be times we didn't have any money to go out to eat or, or anything. And, and Matt, he was a little fella, and we'd just say, we don't have any money. And he'd, he'd say, well, go put your card in that machine, Daddy. It'll give you money. And it, it wasn't simple as that. But, you know, we went through some difficult times. And, you know, uh, Kim and I had owned a business in Wilmington and, and thought we were prosperous and doing well. And, and then because of the circumstances in the economy, uh, we had to close it, and, and, uh, and, and we struggled Struggled very much, and I, and I tell you, I had had gone from owning a business or managing uh, some businesses, and um, had gotten to a place where we we were in in need of money, and uh, you know, and I've probably told this before. I'm certain I probably have, but I I delivered pizzas for Domino's, and uh, you know, and it was really humiliating for me to put that hat and that shirt on and throw that sign on top of my car and run around the college campuses and and place there in there in Wilmington. And, and deliver pizza for Kip. You know, um, there there was there was times that I had ridden by the um, the blood drive places, um, the private run ones where they would give you five dollars for a pint of blood. And um, 
You know, I thank God for that humiliation. I, th- I thank God uh, to teach me a lesson about what it means to depend upon him. Be- because if we don't go through these things, you can never look at someone else and understand what they're going through. Thank God when you go through times like this. Don't look at it as God is punishing you. God is teaching you something. He wants you to be mature. He loves you so much that he allows you to go through these things. If he didn't love you that much, he would just protect you in these areas that you think you need to be protected in, and you would never have any conflict, no problems. Everything would go well. That's not love. I'm a rich man. I'm a rich man, and it's got nothing to do with money in the bank or stuff. It's got nothing to do with that. I'm a rich man because of who I am in Jesus Christ. I'm a rich man because of the family that I have here with me today. I'm a rich man because of my, my, my wife, Kim, and my, and my children, Kenzie and Matt. I'm a rich man. I am the wealthiest man that there is. I have learned to persevere and to overcome. Have you? Have you learned to persevere? Have you learned to overcome? The adversity that comes in your life. Pray that you do. I've told you many times, sometimes people will come and ask me to pray for some situation in your life. Well, I'm going to tell you, friends, be careful. Be careful when you ask me to pray for you. Because I know that the thing that God does to teach us and help us through adversity is to help us get in the midst of it. He doesn't, he doesn't challenge us to go over the adversity or around the adversity. He challenges us to go through it. And knowing that he will be with us through it, you can handle it. And when you come through to the other side, you're going to be so much stronger than you ever were when you were standing on the other side of that hill. Go through it. Go through it, friends. You know, I I hear people talk about a lot of times they'd be so happy if they just won the lottery. If I win the lottery, there's so much I can do for the Lord. (laughs) I'd like to bring the Lord into that when we, uh, when we talk about it. Jesus said he will pass away like a wild flower. Things can't make us happy. God makes us happiness. Happiness is a byproduct of faith in Jesus Christ. I, you know, I see on TV sometimes. I watch, I watch people, they, you know, these mudslides that happen in California or the, or the tornadoes and the hurricanes and stuff. And they stand outside their homes and they cry and they cry and they cry and they say, everything that I loved was in that house has been destroyed. I'm going to tell you what, I, Kim and I, if, if, God, if God saw necessary for it to take everything that we had, I don't think we'd give 30 seconds worth of tears on what we've got in our house. But what we have got in our hearts and what he has given to us in so many other areas, what we have is not even yours. You are stewards of the things that God has has allowed you to use. What are you doing with the things that you have? What are you doing with the money that's in your bank account? What are you doing with the with the with the things in the, in, the, in your homes and, and all? The, what are you doing with those things? Faith in Christ supplies our needs, and He lifts the lowly believer beyond his trials of faith. Faith lifts us us to the lofty positions of being our Father's heavenly children. Faith in Jesus does an equally blessed thing for the rich believer and the poor believer. It fills him or her with a spirit of lowliness and true humility. And for the poor brother, he, he forgets all of the earthly poverty so that the rich brother forgets all of his earthly riches. Amen? The two are equals in faith in Jesus Christ. When you lose lose a loved one, wealth is no comfort. When you lose your health or betrayed by a friend or wrongly accused of something, money can't buy you peace nor decrease the pain that you have in your life. Trials in our lives Trials in our lives are the great equalizer. And that's the truth. I've known a lot of I've known a lot of rich folks that would give everything that they own if their their loved one would just get well and get through the situation that they were in. 
Those things mean nothing. Wealth nor poverty has no bearing upon our relationship with Jesus, only our faith. In verse 12, it said, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. You can see here Jesus' influence of, 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 of James's influence from the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus taught about uh, our, our, the Beatitudes that we know them as, the blessings or the, or the happiness that he discusses. We see that, we see that James here now says, is, you know, blessed are those who persevere, those who persevere. Being blessed is an inner joy of, and satisfaction. Joy that only the Lord Himself can bestow on us. First Peter chapter one six and seven says, "In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be approved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed." You know, this, this word persevere, you know, it means that we've, we've passed the test. We've passed the test. We've been approved. The Greek word there for the word approved is uh, dokimos, D-O-K-I-M-O-S, dokimos. It, it means, that, and, and what they've done, archaeologists have found some, some potteries and, and that have been chipped or broken or wherever they found it, but that word is stamped on the bottom, dokimos. That means that it has withstood the fire. It, it has passed the test. And on some other potteries, there's Ado, Adomokius. Never mind. Adiochimus. Which means disapproved. It did not stand the test. Which one is stamped on you? James is saying that suffering strength strengthens us and that when it occurs and we come out on the other side, we'll be approved. We'll be approved. And our reward is a crown of life. In verse 13, it says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Paul writes in, to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. You need to remember that as I go through this message today. You need to understand that as I finish this. Because so many people tell me that I didn't have a choice. I didn't have a choice. It's so easy to blame God for our failures, isn't it, friends? Adam blamed Eve, and he blamed God for making her. Eve blamed the serpent, and, and, and that's what we do. We pass the buck every opportunity we get. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. It's someone else's. I wouldn't be this way if if my, if, my, if my mother had hugged me more when I was little or, or she didn't feed me so many Twinkies or whatever. You know, we want to blame somebody for the situation that we're in. And my, and my mama hugged me a lot when I was little. I'm not talking about her. But she did give me Twinkies. We blame everybody else. We, we might as well blame God. God, you knew I couldn't handle this situation. You, you knew that, but you allowed me to go into it anyway. You know that there's such a pretty girl in that office there that, that you knew I would have trouble with that. I tell you, friends, temptation comes from the devil. It's designed to make a sin. Now, the amazing thing here is that any circumstances can be either a test or a temptation depending on your response to it. You and I will go through some difficulties in our life, and it, and it may be the loss of a job or a divorce or a sickness or a loss of a loved one. God allows these things to enter our lives to equip us so that we will be mature, to make us complete. But Satan, he intends these very same circumstances to be destructive in our lives and in our faith. And whether they are a test to build or a temptation to destroy depends upon your response to it. Verse 14 and 16, it says, But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed or lured, if you want to look at it that way, when after desire has conceived it gives birth to sin, and sin when it is full grown gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brother. And that word enticed there, it, 
It's a, it's, an, it's a fishing term. Now, you entice the fish, and some of you are better enticers than others. I know that. I'm, a, I'm an awful enticer because I'm an awful fisherman. Unless it's down on Heritage Street, I catch a pretty good catch when I go down that way to rental seafood. Uh, but it's there to lure them in, to bait them, to get them to come to this is what a fisherman does. And an, animals and, and, and fish are, they're, they're lured in that. They're successfully trapped and, and hooked because the bait is so attractive. It smells so good. It looks so delicious that they just can't turn around. They, they may see the shiny hook in there, but they think that they won't bite the hook. They think that they can nibble around and get that little shrimp off of it. And that's the way we are. We, we see it. We see the wrong, but we, we see it. Be, it would be so nice, so sweet, so, so tasty if we could just sample a little bit of it. I won't get too involved. I won't get too deep into it. I just want a little taste of it. And that's when the devil lures you in and traps you. Jesus taught the disciples, lead us not into temptation. It means lead us away from those things. You know the things that tempt you. You know those things. Pray, God, don't let me get there. Don't let me go there. Don't put me in situations where I have to deal with those things. You know what they are. I've seen men and women lose their children because of the temptation. The cheating was so great. The attraction to someone else was stronger than the reason. Sin can look very attractive, friends. It can look so very pleasurable. And it usually is for a little while. And just because you're saved don't mean that you're going to not deal with it. That's another, that's another lie from the devil. Paul recognized that more than anyone in Romans chapter 7, 18, he, he, says, he said, I know that nothing good lives in me. Amen? That is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. You ever feel that way? For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This is this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. So I find the law at work. When, when I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body waging War against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Paul is writing this. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I, I believe, and you all know the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. And, and this, is, this is a story of overcoming temptation. It could, it could be any numbers of other things that you may be dealing with. But this is something that you can use to help you understand how to relate to some temptation in your life and how to respond to a temptation that comes in your life. Joseph, you know him, he was sold in slavery by his own brothers. He was sent to Egypt and he became a prisoner or a slave of, the, of a man named Potiphar who was, who was the captain of a prison. And, and, and everything that Joseph did, even in slavery, prospered. Everything that he touched turned to gold. And the master trusted Joseph with everything in the house. As Joseph got older, as he got older, Potiphar's wife, she began to notice him. And she was accustomed to getting whatever she wanted. And she decided she wanted Joseph. Now, there was something obviously special about him. I'm going to look in Genesis chapter 39. I'm going to read 6 through 12. So you know I'm not making up the story. So he left in Joseph's care everything he had. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you. 
because you were his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Underline that in your Bible. And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day he went into the house and attended his duties and none of the household servants were inside. She caught him by the cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and he ran out of the house. Run, Forrest, run. That's right. Now, Joseph was a good-looking fella. He was a handsome man. You know, we, 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 you, you go to the grocery stores. They've got these magazines right there when you, when you get ready to check out. You've seen them? All these magazines, these fashion magazines and stuff. These good-looking people. Good-looking people. You ever look at them and go, man, I wish I had that body. I don't ever do that, but uh, really no need. But you look at them, you say, man, they've got the prettiest hair. The, 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 every, they look nice, the clothes they have on. If I, if I just looked like them, if I, if, I was, if I were in their place, I would be happy. No, you wouldn't. I, I'm going to tell you, <coughs> truthfully, the prettier the people are, the greater the temptation is in your life. I'm telling you like it is. I don't have that big a problem. I don't have nobody grabbing my jacket and say, come to bed with me. I don't have that problem because I'm a plain-looking fellow. That's okay. I thank God for my plainness. And I'm telling you, if you're like that too, you need to thank him also. But I'm praying for you pretty people. <laughs> mm. When Joseph got there, he was about 18 years old. He was about 27 years old when this all took place. You know, this, this happens a lot. You know, time, there's times at jobs when you're, you know, or, or social situation that you might be in that you, that you, you get involved with somebody that's of the opposite sex. You, you become friends with them. You, you come to like this person. You, you find that you've got things in common. You even begin to find out you talk to things with them that you don't even talk to your own husband or wife with. And I, and, and I'm, I may be speaking to some of you today. You find that you may be attracted to that person. I'm going to tell you, friends, that's not a safe place to be. And we as adults must realize that even though we may be very innocent when these things occur, that there's a possibility for great temptation. Would you agree with me? 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord. Out of a pure heart. Also told the church in Corinth, flee from sexual immorality. There's nothing wrong with running, friends. Not a thing wrong with it at all. The temptation of, uh, of Joseph, Joseph is, is strikingly like that of Adam and Eve. You know, they both had free running, free running in the garden. They, they could do whatever they want. They could, they, could, they could come, go, eat, whatever they want, except from the tree of knowledge. Joseph could do anything he wanted. He had free reign of Potiphar's house. He could do whatever he wanted except from Potiphar's wife. See, the difference in Joseph and Adam, though, Joseph chose not to sin. And you say, well, I can't choose to do that. You absolutely can. You can choose not to sin. Get up every morning. I choose not to sin. We do this a lot of times. If you've been tempted in this way, you may have tried to reason with this person that it was the wrong thing to do. You've, you've read some scripture to him or her and say, you know, this is not what we should do, you know. And what you find out is no matter what you say, no matter what you do, there is no reasoning with them. They won't relent. I'm going to tell you something, friends. You can't reason with an immoral person. That's the truth. You can't, discuss mirror, you can't discuss spiritual matters with carnal people. You, you, you don't have the slight, they don't have the slightest idea of what it is that you're talking about. You can't explain morality to the immoral. They have no clue. Potiphar's wife wasn't reasonable. She, she, did, she wasn't in the mood to hear what Joseph had to say. All she wanted was what she wanted. And I believe that she wanted him all the more because he wouldn't let her. You know people like that. You tell them they can't have something, they'll fight you tooth and nail until they get it. 
Maybe you got kids like that. You tell them they can't have such and such, they are relentless until you give in. That's the way Kim was with me. She was determined to have me. Relentless. <laughs> so what did Joseph do? He ran. He ran away. He ran away. You know? There are times in our lives, friends, you just need to run. You don't need to pray about it. You don't need to form a committee. You don't need to call the deacons up. You don't need to call them to your pastor. You just need to get up and go. Let them take your jacket. Get out of the Dodge. thought I was going to say something else about Dodge, didn't you? We'll talk about temptation again in just a minute. You know, Joseph, he, he, he could look at this situation and say, you know, nobody's going to know anything about this. Nobody's going to know. Nobody will even care. I believe that Joseph was prepared for the temptation. He was prepared for the temptation. You can say you can sit around here and say, "Well, I'm not prepared. I wasn't prepared for the temptation that came my way." That's a lie. You know what? You you know where your weaknesses are. You know the things that you are tempted in. You know them already. Now you say you don't. The reason you say you don't is you just simply ignore them. You don't want to see them, but you know them. And the thing to do when you know what they are is to get away from them. I used to tell my kids all the time when they, were, when they, were, when they got their license and running around, I said, I'm going to tell you, when, when there's something bad happening on that side of the street, you get on this side of the street. You don't need to be over there. You don't need to be tempted with what may happen over there. Get away from it. It doesn't mean that you're less a man. It means that you're a smarter man. You, you can't, I'm going to tell you, you can't deal with temptation at the spur of the moment. You've got to be prepared. You don't need to be caught off guard. The signs are there. The signs are there. You want to ignore them, that's okay. You need to know something, too. Temptation is not a sin. God's not tempting you either. Because we're all tempted. It's how you respond to it is whether or not it's a sin. Temptation comes from within us. It's what's there. It's the nature that is there. Now, you may not like to hear that, but it's true. And if, if you're tempted, it's because that area in your life is weak. And it can be strengthened by overcoming the temptation, but if you know your weaknesses, you need to be prepared for it when, you, when it arrives. I'm, I'm tempted by the Chick-fil-A ice cream. And you can look at me and say, you have succumbed to your temptation, see? Kim went by there last night and brought me one of the one of the new things that they have is the lemonade ice cream. That is delicious. <laughs> so we have to recognize those areas of weakness in our lives. Now, now without me reading the rest of this story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife, I just want to give you the cliff notes on it. You know, the, the woman didn't like the fact that Joseph had shunned her. And, and, and she was used to having her way, so she screamed out when he ran out, rape, or something like that. And everybody ran in, and, and she, told, she told her husband, Potiphar, what had happened. And, and Potiphar, he takes Joseph and throws him in jail. Well, you know, when you do good things, when you do the right things, good things are supposed to happen to you, right? I mean, I hear preachers say that on TV all the time. That's, that's what's supposed to happen. If I do the good things, if I do this and do that, prosperity and wealth and goodness and mercy and all that stuff's going to come my way. Is that the way it happens in life? I'm going to tell you what. Most likely, those are going to be the rare occasions in your life. I'm going to tell you something, friends. God don't grow dainty Christians. He's interested in warriors that will stand and, and, and defeat the things that the devil is doing around us. And you cannot handle it, as Jack Nicholson said, you cannot handle it if you don't have to deal with it. You've got to stand in those places. You've got to be prepared. You've got to go through those adversities in order for you to be able to be the soldier and the warrior that God has designed you to be. He's not interested in some dainty little Christians. He wants somebody that can stand firm in where they're at. These experiences in our lives are humbling, friends. I know it. And they're often sent by God. 
that we can become reliant on him and not ourselves. Joseph was to learn lessons through these experiences in life. And he did. He did. He didn't understand them as he was going through. Most likely, he's like all the rest of us. He learned that these, dif- these lessons were difficult. Life wasn't fair. And what we learn, what we learn in these difficult times, I'm telling you, friends, the things that we learn through the difficult times are the things we never forget. The things that happen to us when we're in, in, in the so-called ease of our lives are the things that are easily forgotten. Go through some difficulty. We were just talking about this morning, about working in the tobacco fields. Me and Vivian were talking about it. I, you know, it, th- those, were, those were tough. Those sand lugs were not easy. I mean, you know what I say when I say sand lugs. Yeah, not all of you do. I think I was born under a tobacco patch. God's preparing us for something better, friends. He's preparing us for something else. And whatever it is you're going through, there's preparations involved in it. We need to recognize it. Look at the difficult times in your lives as a boot camp. Schooling for some greater purpose. Also, I want you to consider this thing, too. Is that I, I, I'm sure that Joseph often prayed, protect me. Protect me from this evil woman. And how did God do it? Threw him in jail. <laughs> That's not what he wanted. He probably wanted the woman to, you know, leave or, or something, you know. And to protect me from this woman, and God puts him in jail. Now, that don't make any sense. God, that's not what I asked for. But that's exactly what God wanted. I tell you, a lot of times, friends, the prayers that we pray, we're looking for something specific, and it ain't what it is, and we think God's not answering our prayer. He's answering your prayer. He's answering the prayer. You just need to look at what it is and see how it is that you're supposed to respond to it. How we respond to God's answers are the main thing. Not that the prayer is not as we want it or the answer to the prayer is what we wanted. Suffering and adversity is viewed by Christian as a normal part of Christian life. Expect it even when we live righteous lives. In 2 Corinthians 4, 7, and 10, it says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us, from us. You know, you hear me read this a lot. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Philippians 2, Philippians 1.29 says, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, listen to me, but also to suffer for him. Hmm. Joseph's final response to this, if you'll remember, how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? I was speaking with some friends some time ago and and said that many Christians today just don't fear God. There's no fear of God. No fear of God in their churches. Proverbs 10, 9, 10 says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's why we got so many fools around us. I believe that too often we get this fearing of God confused. Fearing of, fearing of God is not what God's going to do to me. When I, when, I, when I think of fearing God, I, I think of, 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 of what I, by my actions, will do to him. We're breeding a generation of people in the church that has no notion of what it means to fear God, nor are they concerned about it. Fearing God is a negative image of God. We don't, we don't, want, we don't want no negative images in the church. We want, to, we want to preach things that are uplifting, make you feel good. I'm not going to talk about sin. I know preachers that say, I don't use the word sin in my church because I don't want people to be beaten down when they come here. I want to lift them up. Meanwhile, immorality is rampant outside and inside the church because we're letting go of the foundational principle that stands against immorality, which is the fear of God. When we fall prey of sexual temptation, we are no more concerned with our own desires, or we are rather more concerned with our own desires than we are the desires of our Father in heaven. And I, I'm not just talking about sexual 
temptation. I'm talking about any temptation. Whatever it is that you deal with, you are more concerned with what it is that pleases you than what it is that pleases God. I'll tell you this too, young people. You guys have got boyfriends and girlfriends, and you're saying, well, Steve, you're not doing anything. I'll tell you what, you continue to put yourself in maybe some of the positions that you are, you will. You will. Fear the Lord. Flee from temptation. Flee because you would not dare sin against God. Verse 16 says, do not deceive, be deceived, my dear brothers. I'm going to just tell you, friends, stop blaming everybody for your circumstances in your life, especially stop blaming God. Take responsibility for your life. Stop rationalizing your sins and simply come before God and ask for forgiveness. When temptation com becomes full-blown, it becomes sin, and we've got no one to blame but ourselves. Verse 17 and 18 says, every good and perfect gift is from above. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Everybody else will know. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. James is saying again that there is no temptation or anything evil that comes from God. There's nothing evil that comes from God, friends. What comes from God is goodness and nothing evil. Everything that comes from God is intended to make us better, to make us more like his son, Jesus Christ. Not to push us away. He is the source of all light. The source of light. Malachi 3.6 says, I, the Lord, do not change. I've heard, I've heard people come to me and say, yes, today's times are different, though, Steve. And God knows that. He's adjusting to it. Let me tell you, God does not adjust to anything. It should be we that adjust to him. We need to begin to look at our lives and, and get in line with what it is that God directs us to do and what to do and how to live. Not that he should get in line with us. Not that he needs to get in line with the 21st century. Not that he needs to change his attitude and his mindset. You and I need to change the way we think and to see things. First John 1 John 1.5, God is light and in him there's no darkness. I'm going to tell you, friends, there's no darkness concerning God. There's, 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 there's no sneaking agenda. There's no deception. Everything is open and understood. I, I love when it talks about in Revelation about how heaven will be. It will be this city that comes down and, and everything will be open. It will be a crystal city. We can see all things. You know, there's nothing to hide. There's nothing that we need to hide here. You know, I'm just telling you, temptation is something that we all deal with. Every one of us in here, I don't care what it is, it's something that you deal with. And it's something that you can overcome. Look at every situation in your life as an opportunity to be strengthened by it. Because there's a purpose that God has for each of us in this hour. Rejoice. Rejoice when we go through these trials. Rejoice when we're dealing with issues with our family. Rejoice if you're dealing with some financial problems. Rejoice if you're dealing with problems with your children. Rejoice that God is going to bring you through it and make you stronger because of it. Are you with me? Let's pray then. God, I, I pray that as James writes so plainly and bluntly, But you teach us something today. We learn something today. God, we don't walk out of this place ignorant. We walk out of this place with some knowledge of, of, of some things that we need to learn. And the knowledge of how we should respond to things differently. The knowledge that some things that we just need to get away from. But God, I, you, you want to make us holy. We, we, are, we are told that we're your temple. My Lord, purify us. Cleanse us. If you have to run us through the fire, send us on through, God. 
to strengthen us as we go through. That we don't complain and whine every moment of our lives. That we look at these adversities that James talks about as an opportunity to be mature and to be complete. I want to be complete. I want to be complete. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Bob comes and he leads us in our invitational hymn.